So the mystery of the robes of Christ. Now, obviously, it's quite a peculiar title. Um, and uh, it just happened to be something that that, had, that has been on my mind for probably about a year now um, after coming across um, a particular um, mystery. That's it, really. And so what I'd love to do when Brother Peter said, look, Matt, you know, maybe um, we could get you to speak. What have you got? I, th- I immediately turn to this. So we'll see. Hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll find it useful, encouraging, enlightening. And uh, as we go through, humbling um, as we consider these things. First of all, though, let's, um, let's begin by, um, by having a quick look at um, Matthew chapter 27. So if we could open up Matthew chapter 27. Um, and for, this, for the sake of this evening's class, it's probably good to put a marker in here and also another marker in Mark chapter 15. So I'm going to read this for you now, Matthew chapter 27. And if we start at verse 26, we're going in here at the at the very appalling time when the Lord, of course, has been brutally and is being brutally scourged just before the crucifixion. So this is what we read in Matthew chapter 27, verse 26. Then released he, that's Pilate, Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it on upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him. And took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that, they took that they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. Now, I'm sure we're quite familiar with that account. And did you notice there um, in in verse um, in verse 28, the fact that the, the spirit records that they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. So I want you to note that. Now, keep your hand here in Matthew. Let's just flick over to the parallel account in Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. And um, and we're going to actually read from verse 15. And we see it's the, the same account. After the Jews have cried out, crucify him. This is what happens, verse 15. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band, and they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it about his head and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him on the head with a reed and did spit upon him and bowed, bowing their knees, worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, They took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. Now, I'm sure you can see on the screen, but can you see that we have a strange phenomena here? Because unlike the Matthew record, which states that the soldiers put a scarlet robe upon Christ here, we read that they clothed him with purple. And this, brothers and sisters, young people, friends, this is the mystery that we want to dig into this evening. We have, well, I've come across a number of suggestions. These are not all of them. We'll look at some other ones in a minute as to why this could be the case. A quick sort of Google and going to uh, to see what other, other folks say on this. Um, you'll find that these kind of suggestions, well, maybe the robe was purple. But it was an old robe, right? They weren't going to put new robes on the Lord after he'd just been scourged um, and was bleeding. So maybe it was purple, but because it was an old robe, it had faded to scarlet, right? And and actually, therefore, kind of both accounts were kind of right. Um, it was purple, but now it faded to scarlet. One suggestion. Another suggestion. As the colors are similar between purple and scarlet, perhaps maybe the subjective opinion of the writer was injected into the text. That is one suggestion. And perhaps another suggestion is, well, maybe, maybe here is a contradiction. Maybe one writer got it wrong. They were doing the best they could. They, they didn't remember it correctly. 
they got the wrong impression. It wasn't it, it wasn't purple, it was red, or it wasn't red, it was purple. So there's some suggestions, and, and obviously there's some more, and I'll come on to the ones in a minute. But let's just deal with these top three first. Because this idea that, that both colours are kind of similar, maybe one had faded to another, I don't think quite, quite works. Because in Scripture, of course, we know that no words are, are wasted. And um, as an example, um, in Revelation 17, verse 4, we know that these are two distinct colours. The Word of God, the Bible, uses these two words uh, differently. So here we have in Revelation, of course, the, 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 the harlot woman on the beast, and she is arrayed in purple and scarlet color. So they can't be the same color, just kind of um, just a little, little bit of difference in there. There's two very distinct colors in scripture, scarlet and purple. So we can dismiss that for a second. And, and as to the other two suggestions, well, we as Christadelphians, we believe in the inspiration of the scriptures, don't we? And so we believe that God has breathed out these scriptures and therefore they are useful, right? Because if man had written them, it wouldn't be useful. These scriptures are useful. They're, they're, they're profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. These scriptures were breathed out by God himself. And we know that the Gospels fall into this category divinely called scripture, and therefore they come from God. And we can see that. I'm sure many of us who've uh, studied the subject of inspiration have come across 1 Timothy 5 verse 18, where the Lord says that the scripture says, and then he quotes from Deuteronomy, and he quotes from Matthew and Luke. And so what that tells us is that the gospel accounts fall into this category called scripture. They are breathed out of God. So we have to be sensitive, do we not? Like we do with the whole of scripture as to how we treat God's word. And of course, in terms of sort of simple statements around how this came to be, we have the, 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 the key passage in 2 Peter 1.21 the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And we know that that word moved in the in the Greek is actually used in Acts 27 verse 17. It kind of has the the meaning of being compelled or driven. And it's used there in Acts 27 to describe an uncontrollable ship driving in the wind towards the shore. And so when we just read the Bible and we look at it, OK, this is God causing this thing to be written, causing these words to to be chosen, to be placed down. And um, and so it, it, it kind of cannot be that this is just left to the whim of the writer. In fact, um, if you're making notes, John 14, 26 tells us that when the Holy Spirit was given, that it would give them a perfect recollection of everything that happened with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Luke, and so Matthew, and so Mark, and so John, these are not just the whims of these men. They are a perfect recollection of, their, of what happened. They are the words chosen by God, but penned by these men. Now, obviously, we don't know exactly how the mechanism of inspiration works, and I don't think we're asked to, 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 to know that from Scripture. All we are asked to do, brothers and sisters, is to believe that these are the words of God and to submit to them in our lives and to give them a lofty and a high and a holy place in our hearts and minds and to reverence them and respect them and to believe them. That's all we're asked to do, brothers and sisters, to believe that they're the words of God. And we know that because they are the words of God, they are true. That's the only way we can believe God, if we can accept that he's, he's the God of truth. And in fact, um, I know we've been there in our readings, have we not, brothers and sisters, together this week? Um, Titus 1 verse 2, God that cannot lie. We read in John that, that God's word is truth. We read in Colossians, the word of the truth of the gospel. We read in Thessalonians, the word of God is truth. And we read in Daniel, the scriptures of truth. So 
We cannot treat these things lightly. Um, this cannot have been left to the whim of the penman. It cannot be their opinion entering into the text. We have to reject these three initial ideas. So what about other options? What else could be going on here, um, we wonder? So one suggestion we could come up with is, well, maybe they're two different occasions. Um, I've just put on the screen um, the, the, the beautiful chiasms, actually, that exist in the accounts, the, the, the patterns, the parallels of ideas and words which, which bring us to the center point. And the center point of both of these passages is to highlight to us how the Lord was mocked and, you know, basically laughed at and called king of the Jews in, in an absolute disgraceful mockery of the situation. But there it is. And so we are forced to come to terms with the shame and the, uh, the awful trial that the Lord went through. But can we say these are two different occasions? Well, I don't think we can. I've, I've, I've kind of attempted in this next sort of part of the slide to show how most of the words carry across in both of these accounts. And you can see it's in the B section on both of these accounts where the, 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 the colors are mentioned. And you, you can see that the events before and the events afterwards, they flow in a historical pattern. So these can't be two different events. They're at the same event. Now, before we go any further, brothers and sisters, I think we need to stop because I, I think we need to, rather than this just be kind of an academic study, we need to allow it to affect us and we need to be exhorted and uh, we need to apply some of these things in our lives, do we not, for it to be useful to us. And this is what it says, doesn't it, in Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 6, that we should be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Brother Daffod earlier in the, uh, in the week picked up on that fainting in our minds, didn't he? And exhorted us to pray so that we do not faint. But we think of the Lord here enduring the contradiction we think of him, you know, getting through the shame, the pain, the anguish to sacrifice himself in obedience to the father to hang on that cross until the end. And notice what Hebrews tells us from an exhortational point of view. This should these thoughts should do for us. And this is where it comes home. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. We've not done that, brothers and sisters, not unto blood. Ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And so we're all here in lockdown. We're all going through, through trials, brothers and sisters. But when we consider the problems of our life in comparison to what the Lord went through in obedience, they paled, do they not, brothers and sisters, into insignificance as we think upon our master. Now, what is the answer then to this, uh, this mystery? Um, well, let's take a step towards answering that. Um, I think what we are being told, if we look carefully at the accounts, there are, in fact, two garments here. One, I'm going to suggest to you, at the same time. And so, both um, accounts are correct. Both are accurate. But only when we search the scriptures and compare spiritual with spiritual do we find the truth of the matter. So, for example, we can tell because in Matthew 27, 28, we read that, that they put on him a scarlet robe. The word robe in the Greek, is, and I'm probably going to say this wrong, so forgive me if you speak Greek, but is klamus. And that, we are told is a cloak worn by soldiers specifically. And we, we, it's the only time we actually come across it in scripture. But, um, but from the understanding uh, that we get elsewhere, it's uh, a cloak worn by soldiers, a scarlet cloak, a red cloak, a military cloak, a cloak of red. And when we go over to the Mark account, it says they clothed him with purple. Well, that's not actually that helpful because the word clothed just simply means to to array, to clothe, to put on. 
But in the John record, in John 19, and I know uh, we have already been in John 19 with Brother, bro brother Jonathan and uh, I think even with Brother Kevin um, were, earlier in the week. But in John 19, it says, doesn't it, that they put on him a purple robe. And the word robe there is the Greek hemation. And uh, hemation just means a general undergarment. It's kind of just a, a normal garment, usually worn uh, over the left shoulder and under the right in those times. And that's, uh, translate, that's kind of used 62 times in scripture, and it's quite a, a general description of a garment, right? So one, though, is a special cloak, and one is a general garment. And the, the two are different, I'm going to suggest to you. One's red, of course, one's purple. One's a cloak. One is just an undergarment. So we say, ah, okay, that makes sense. Um, we've solved the mystery, you know, that's it. But I don't think we can just stop there, brothers and sisters. We need to ask, why? You know, every word of God is inspired. Every word, every detail God has caused and designed to be placed in his scriptures of truth so that we can grow so that we can be truly furnished unto all good works so that we can learn of him and his divine ways so we can manifest his character. What, what does this mean when we come across these small things? And uh, I think it's always helpful in our readings to always ask, why? Why do we think this is? It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Why? Why do we have these details? Well, the mystery actually thickens when you zoom out a little bit. Can we turn over, please, to, to the gospel account of Luke and Luke chapter 20, uh, 23? Because in the inspired account of Luke, we read actually that there is another garment the Lord wears in his last day on the earth before his crucifixion, before his death before his great sacrifice, before his victory, final triumph over sin. So in Luke chapter 23, just to kind of um, give you a rough summary, in verses six to seven, we know that when Christ first is hauled before Pilate, Pilate finds out that he is a Galilean. And, and it turns out that Herod is in Jerusalem at this time. And Herod deals with the, with the, with the, with the kind of the governance of Galilee. So Pilate sends Christ to Herod, doesn't he, in verses six to seven. And then we have Christ before Herod and Herod is questioning Jesus in verses eight to nine. And the Lord remains silent, doesn't he? And then we have the Jews accusing Christ. And then we have Herod's men mocking Christ. And then Herod sends Christ back to Pilate and Herod and Pilate are friends again after that point. And then we have Pilate's verdict and then we enter the account that we've already looked at. But from the record of Luke, the Jews cry out against Christ. Pilate attempts to pacify them. There's another cry of the Jews, which eventually prevails. And then Pilate gives sentence, releases Barabbas. And then we have the events of the crucifixion. But, um, but just glance down and look at uh, what happens after Herod and his men begin to mock the Lord in verse 11. It says there, and Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. So here we have another robe that the Lord is given, is to wear, is forced to wear. And um, this is a different type of garment again. So when we look into what this robe is all around uh, all, all about we read that it is is gorgeous but in the greek that is lampros which when you look at how that word is used in scripture it really means a bright goodly gorgeous uh, kind of gay clear it's translated as white it's translated as twice garment it's talking about a bright garment probably white and when we read the word robe in this context, it's another word again. It is the Greek esres, and that means apparel, clothing, robe, or raiment, as it's translated. Now, when we look at where these words are used, we've got um, the white linen of Revelation, uh, chapters 15 and 19, and uh, on through Revelation, the white. 
Um, we've also got the um, the idea of um, the the white apparel in Acts one with S threes on the far right hand side of your screen. Um, the, the the men that appeared in white apparel, and in fact Herod himself appears in this royal apparel as it's translated in Acts twelve twenty one before he is struck down by an angel for not giving glory to God. Now, and they're used together, aren't they, in Acts chapter ten, verse thirty. Um, um, there and in James 2 verse 23 in goodly apparel um, the gay clothing of that we are not to have respect says James for people that come to us in expensive clothing in this lampros esthes this important clothing and so we conclude from the use of scripture that really what this is talking about here is an important piece of clothing, probably white, probably made from linen because of its connections in the rest of Scripture. Now, again, we just pause because we think of the Lord going through his trials, don't we? We, we think of the prophecy in Isaiah 53, which tells us that um, he was oppressed and afflicted and he opened not his mouth as he was before Herod. Is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And uh, we think of the fact that, that, that these garments, particularly that Lampros one by Herod's men that he was clothed in, was, was probably clothed in in mockery because here was one who claimed to be or was being said to be the king of the Jews and who was the king of the Jews. And yet here he was, he was poor, probably um, you know, very disheveled at that point after all the stress and the trials of keeping down sin throughout his life. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, says Corinthians 8 verse 9, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And so we see sinful sons of men. We see them um, mocking the Lord in this way and giving him this gorgeous robe when in fact they were doing it not out of respect but out of sheer and utter contempt and there's a fourth garment brothers and sisters there's one more that the lord wears on his last days uh, and his last day let's go over back to matthew chapter 27 um and just uh, and just remind ourselves we did actually read this earlier but it's just worth um, just picking it up, because we know, of course, that after the soldiers of Pilate mocked the Lord, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, they, they spat at him. They gave him a reed, didn't they? And then they struck him around the head with the reed. And bear in mind, this is after he's been scourged, already abused by Herod's men. A late night, the trials, the pressure and the stress must have been amazing. You know, this is after his his weeping in the garden, his intense prayers, his sweating like uh, great beads of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and he's going through all of this, brothers and sisters. And it really brings it home when you, when you ponder the account. But anyway, after all of that, and after all that mocking in the, in the red and purple garments, we read in verse 35, um, um, well, no, sorry, in verse um, 31, that they, uh, they took the robe from off him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And the, and the Mark account says they, they took off the purple from him. So they took the red cloak and they took the, the purple off him. And it says they led him away to be crucified, but not before they had put his own raiment on him, his own garments, his, home, his own hematian on him. And so the Lord has put his own garment on. And in fact, when we actually look at um, the accounts, the Lord also had, it seems, undergarments and a cloak, because we read in John 19 that, um, that, um, uh, he, uh, his, that, that when he was on uh, the cross, of course, the soldiers, and we'll know this well, when they crucified him, they took these garments, they took his garments, and they made four parts. So they took his undergarments and they, they tore them up, the, his himenaeton. But his coat, his chiton, they, uh, they didn't do that. And it says there, doesn't it, the coat was without seam, woven from top throughout, 
They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them and my vesture. They did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now, that tells us a few things, doesn't it, brothers and sisters? Number one, it tells us that there were two parts to Christ's garments. But also it tells us that when he hung on the cross, he was not wearing anything. You know, this is a, a humiliating, a, a horrific death without clothing. Now, we know, of course, the Lord, the, the, the passage that, that, that John, through inspiration, directs our attention to is Psalm 22, verse 18. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. There, the word garments in the Hebrew is beged. And we know that this very psalm was on the Lord's mind beyond any shadow of a doubt, because he says, doesn't he, Lama, Lama, um, Eli Sabachthani, doesn't he, on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Quoting directly from Psalm 22. So this would have been on the Lord's mind as he looked down from the cross to see what they were doing with his garments. And I believe that, brothers and sisters, that that none of these things are here by chance. None of these things of the garments that Christ was forced to wear, the colors of the garments, none of that is by chance. Because like as he would have looked down, I believe, and seen his garments fulfilling this prophecy, that there's other prophecies, there's other divine thought at work in why we have these details for us left in scripture and why they actually happened for real in history. Now, just a couple of thoughts on the garments of Christ. Um, we've mentioned Himaiatan uh, before. It's like this undergarment. Um, it's a, a general piece of apparel. Um, and we've also mentioned this, this coat, this chiton, which of course was, was, was Christ's. Interestingly, brothers and sisters, it says in Mark 14, 63, that the high priest had one of these. The high priest rent his chiton and saith, what need we of any further witnesses? And the high priest had done this in the trial when Christ was before the Sanhedrin. Now, the point I want you to remember, though, is that Christ's coat was therefore like or called by the same, the same descriptive name as that of the high priest. And it is actually, I believe, put in here um, for a reason, um, at least in that, if, in that account, because, of course, what we are being directed to do by the Spirit is to compare Christ with the high priest. And in Leviticus chapter 21, we are told in the law that the high priest should uncover his head nor rend his garments. The high priest should not rend his garments. OK, and yet. We've seen in Matthew 26 that the high priest rent his garments. And if I jump back a slide, Mark 14, the high priest rent his chiton. So the high priest rent his cloak. And if we are reading this correctly, he rent his clothes, his undergarments in Matthew 26, verse 65. The high priest rent them all. And yet the law had said, do not rend them. And yet the Lord's garment, the Lord's chiton remained unrent as he hung on the cross. Now, notice a couple of other things here in the account through John. It says there that uh, the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments, made four parts. And then it says, now the coat, the chiton, was without seam woven from the top throughout. So this was one piece of gar woven garment. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it. Now, when we look at the high priest's garment, brothers and sisters, it says there in Exodus 28, and again, you know, we, we highlight here, it looks like the spirit is directing our attention using the same phrases, using the same ideas to this passage of the high priest's garment. Let me just read it, Exodus 28, 31 to 32. And thou shalt make the robe of the ephod all of blue, and there shall be an hole in the top of it, in the midst thereof. It shall have a binding of woven work round about the whole of it, as it were the whole of an habergeon, that it be not rent. Exodus 28, 31 to 32. And so we have this connection with the outer garment of Christ that was not rent. And the high priest's garment that Caiaphas rent in the time of Christ, but that should not have been rent. 
And, uh, and notice, brothers and sisters, what colour this garment was to be. It was to be all of blue. Now, my suggestion, therefore, my strong suggestion is that the Spirit is directing our attention to Exodus 28 to teach us that Christ's garment was after the pattern of the high priest. And therefore, I think it is totally reasonable to conclude that it was blue after this pattern, like it was seamless, like it had a hole in the midst of it and, and, and a weave round about it. The other thing to consider is Christ's garments would have also contained, for sure, the ribboned of blue, because we know that the uh, this was pick, this is picked up in Numbers 15, 38, that all the children of Israel were to to make on their garments this ribboned of blue. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got on the screen there a Jewish chalet. They, they, they look at it and, and that's how the Jews do it even today in their prayer shawls. And uh, interesting in passing that um, that the reason that they were to do this ribbon of blue on their garments was so that they when they look on it, they remember all the commandments of Yahweh, it says in, in Numbers 15. And so interestingly, they walked, didn't they, in in the in in the commandments of the Lord. That was the ideal. And when they looked at the ribbon of blue, it was to remind them of God, to remind them of God's commandments and their walk before him. And when, um, interestingly, later, we have the woman with the issue of blood. Do you remember? She touches, doesn't she, the hem of Christ's garment, the blue bit, I'm going to suggest, the bit that reminds us of his obedience to all the commands of Yahweh, that he was without sin, neither was guile on in his mouth. And she is healed, associating herself with the, uh, the, the, the perfect sacrifice of the Lord. Now, that's by and by, but, but I put that in there to say that there is this close connection between the Lord's garments and the color blue when we follow it through in Scripture. Now, what we're looking at here, therefore, I believe is, is four very distinct garments. We have the white linen Lampros gorgeous robe of Luke 23, 11. We have the scarlet Clamis cloak of Matthew 27, 28, the red robe. We have the purple Himatian, the purple robe, um, also worn at the same time when Pilate's men were mocking the Lord. And then they put on him, on him his own garments to lead him away to be crucified before he stripped naked. And one of those garments was for sure made after the pattern of the high priest and was most probably blue and definitely blue would have been part of the Lord's garments because it definitely would have contained this hem of blue. So there we go. So we've, we've, we've actually deepened the mystery of the robes because that's all very well and interesting, isn't it, brothers and sisters, when we look at all these details. But, but we're going to ask the question, why again? Why do we have these things um, detailed to us in the scriptures of truth? Surely they're there for us to search out the matter. Surely they're there for us to ponder and to think upon and to meditate on. So what's the answer? Well, this is one suggestion, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll, you'll find this exhortational and interesting. Because if I was to say to you, where do we find fine linen, blue, purple, scarlet, together in Scripture, where would, where would your mind go? And, of course, I'm sure it would go to the tabernacle, the, the meeting place of Yahweh with his people. We know that the tabernacle and the things under the law are prophetic. We're told that very plainly in scripture in Galatians 3, that, it's, that the law was just a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Hebrews is packed full of language, like the, the, the law was a shadow of heavenly things, a pattern of the things in the heavens, a shadow of the things to come. Like the things to come are in bright sunlight and they casted a shadow down back into the law. And those living under the law could only see in shadow, but, but they were all pointing up to the reality of the things that were going to be real and now are real in the uh, the scriptures and in and, and in the things that unfolded. So when we get to the tabernacle, let's just go over to Exodus. If everybody could just um, flick back to Exodus, I just want to show you a couple of interesting things around these colours 
that we that we come across. So we're first going to start in Exodus chapter 26, and um, we're going to look at um, at verse one. This is, uh, I think, the first time all of these colours come into play. It says in Exodus 26 verse one: Moreover, thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen, and blue and purple, and scarlet, with cherubim of coming work, shalt thou make them. So the actual curtains of the tabernacle were made of these colours. Just flick over to uh, 26, Exodus 26, um, verse um, 36 this time. Um, it says there, Thou shalt make an hanging for the door of the tent of purple and uh, of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen. And thou shalt make for the hanging of the five pillars and so on and so forth. So the door of the tabernacle, so just the tabernacle itself, but there was other things over the top, goats and goat skin and all sorts of things. But the actual curtains were of this and actually the front door, the front veil, the front, the front entrance, if you like, was was also of these colours. And in fact, the actual entrance to the whole tabernacle itself in Exodus 27 and verse 16, you read there that the gate to that entrance, the gate of the court, shall be in hanging of 20 cubits of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen wrought with needlework. So what is this telling us? Well, it's telling us, isn't it not, brothers and sisters? We know this is a parable. We know what these things mean. When you go from um, the, the the court of the Gentiles, you go through the various symbols, the, the sacrifice uh, for sin, you go through the, the cleansing of the laver, and you enter into the, uh, the, the holy place, don't you, brothers and sisters? And those entrances and the way into the holy place, they are all concealed by these colors. And what does Jesus tell us in John 10? He says, I am the door. OK, he's the door. He's the entrance. And we're in the holy place and we know the parables well. We haven't got time to do a huge study on this, but we know, don't we, brothers and sisters, the beauty of the symbols of the prophecies of the law that that in this holy place, when that when that front veil was closed, you wouldn't have seen anything. And so you need the light of the candlestick, the light of God's word to see what you're doing. You need it to, to pray effectively. You need it to have fellowship in the table of showbread. And here we are, brothers, this is where we are right now. We're in the holy place. And of course, we're desiring to go to the most holy place where the, where the cherubim are, where the, the ark of God is, where the Shekinah glory of God dwells. But there's something in the way, isn't there, brothers and sisters? There's something dividing us, one last division. And that, of course, is the veil. So if you look at uh, Exodus 27, uh, 26 again, sorry, and verse 31, we read about this veil. And thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen of cunning work with cherubim. Shall it be made and thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold. Their hook shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver. And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tachets and thou shalt bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony and the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. And thou shalt set, uh, 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 sorry, and thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. And thou shalt set the table without the veil and the candlestick over against and so on and so forth. And so we have this division between the most holy and the holy and the thing that is dividing it is the veil. Interestingly, when Solomon built the temple, again, the sec uh, Solomon's temple, the, the um, well, the temple, um, he also, we're told very specifically in scripture, he also builds this and weaves this exact same veil. It says that he made the veil of blue and purple and crimson and fine linen and wrought cherubim thereon. So it's important to know these colors the scriptures is telling us. Now, when the Lord died, brothers and sisters, what happened to the veil in the temple? Well, we're told from Scripture that the veil of the temple was rent in twain, wasn't it, brothers and sisters? Christ had entered into the most holy. He'd, he'd passed through the veil and the actual physical veil in the temple was rent. It tells us it was, um, was rent in twain 
um, from the top to the bottom in Matthew. Now, of course, that that would be really strange because it was hanging on tachets at the top. So you couldn't actually do this uh, as a human could do it. And then uh, from the top to the bottom, you'd do it from the bottom to the top, wouldn't you? So this was a divine act. The angels were at work to teach the Jews at the time to put it on the record, to teach us something that, that this was a divine thing that was taking place. Now, history, the historians tell us that that veil at the time was actually really thick as well. So it's not something that could easily have been done. Somebody, I think one of the historians says it was, it was four, four fingers thick or five fingers thick. So this is a very thick piece of, of woven um, material. And remember what it said in Exodus 26. What was the point of this veil? It was to divide the holy and the most holy, to separate them off from each other. Now, I want us to go to Hebrews because we learn about what it's all about in Hebrews chapter 9. And um, I think this also holds the key to our understanding of why the Spirit has left on record these details about the mystery of the clothes of Christ, of the garments of Christ. So let's go over, first of all, to Hebrews chapter 9 and, uh, and verse 2, just to remind ourselves. I'm sure... These things are very familiar with uh, to us. But remember what it says there in Hebrews 9. It's talking about the first covenant, verse 1. And verse 2, it says, there was a tabernacle made. And then uh, the, uh, the, the Spirit talks about the, 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 two, the two parts to this tabernacle. The first part, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. That's the, the holy place, right? And then it says in verse 3, and after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. And then in verse four, it talks about a golden censer and we get a bit of confused. What's this golden censer? There's no mention of that. But of course, um, on the day of atonement, the golden censer was taken into the most holy place. And Hebrews chapter nine, therefore, is talking about the day of atonement when the high priest entered in to obtain atonement and, uh, and forgiveness for the people of Israel. And this is the picture being painted here in the types and the shadows of Hebrews chapter nine. Now, just glance to verse seven. But into the second, the most holy place, went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So that was the point to show that while this veil was there, way to connect with God. The, 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 the reconciliation with God was not through the law. It wasn't there. They, they, they couldn't just go in and out of that place. The high priest could only go in it and only go in it once per year. And even then had to go in it with sacrifice, with blood, and he could only go in alone. And there was a specific reason to, to cleanse uh, the errors of the people and, and offer for himself. Now, just bear that in mind, brothers and sisters, when we flick on and flip back to Hebrews chapter 6. Look at Hebrews 6, verse 17. It says there, Hebrews 6, 17, that God is willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed by an oath. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. And we get the idea of the cities of refuge and running to that, that place of safety. And God cannot lie. He's given us this consolation. In verse 19, it says, which hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made and high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so one has passed through the veil, gone through the veil. One is a forerunner. The one is the Lord Jesus Christ who crucified the flesh, sacrificed the flesh on the cross to declare the worthlessness of human nature and of the problem of, of human nature and the flesh and for that and, in, and for his obedience was granted eternal life to be with the father. He's in within the veil, brothers and sisters. 
Isn't that wonderful? And when we think about the types. And here's the crowning passage. Just go over to Hebrews chapter 10 and look at verse 19. Because, you see, the Lord has gone in, our representative, before us, the forerunner. And we are in him We are if we have been baptized. And if we haven't, my dear friends, think of this that you can't access the most holy place unless you are in a covenant relationship, unless you've been baptized, unless you are in Christ, unless you elect him as your representative rather than Adam. But we have those of us that have been baptized. And what does it say here in in verse 19? It says, having therefore, brethren, boldness or confidence to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with full assurance. And so, brothers and sisters, we have, do we not, here a wonderful thing, because it tells us what the veil signified. The veil signifies flesh. In in fact, it signifies the flesh of the Lord Jesus. Now, what does that mean? Well, we've, as a community, we've got, we've had various ideas on this. We've looked down to scripture to try and understand what the colors of this veil might indicate. We have the idea of, um, and, and these are these are just some of the ideas um, of, of blue being um, reminding us of, of godliness and, and the divine spirit. We saw that in the hem of the garment that they needed to put together. There's another reference there in Exodus and um, where where we see that, that God is connected to being um, standing on sapphire stone, which, of course, was blue. So we get all these connections with heavenliness and the ideas of that. Of course, we have scarlet, which is which is reminds us of sin. And uh, and and so we have like the sins being a scarlet there. Purple is often associated with royalty and, of course, white linen righteousness. Now, these were all combined, were they not, these ideas in the flesh of the Lord when he lived? Because, of course, he was the son of God and he was born of a woman and he had the same problem that we have. He had he was tempted in all points, but yet without transgressional sin. But nonetheless, he was made sin for us. He had sin's nature. He had um the same problem, the promptings that we do, but he never gave into them. This is a, a standard doctrine that we have, is it not, brothers and sisters? Uh, and he countered that, didn't he, with the spirit, with the divine thinking of the spirit. And he was, of course, after the line of David. He was a royal personage. And of course, he was righteous in all his ways. And so all of these ideas were blended into the life of Christ. Now, a brother, John Martin, has this to say in his study notes on Hebrews, and it's quite he puts it so well, I thought, let's let's read what our brother wrote about this. He says, amongst the colors interwoven into the veil was that of scarlet. It was a prophecy that flesh was that which was hid uh, was that which hid God's presence from his people. Also inwrought into the veil of the tabernacle were figures of cherubim, symbols of God in manifestation. The original mention of cherubim becomes highly suggestive of the significance involved in the color and embroidery of the veil of the temple. In the Garden of Eden, cherubim were placed by God to keep the way of the tree of life. It was from this context that the Lord quoted when he said to him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the tree of life, thus indicating that it is he who keeps the way of life. Now, it is to be noted that the cherubim of Eden did not close the way to the tree of life, but they guarded it in the Hebrew. That is, They kept it open so that if any would, they might approach in the manner appointed. On the day that Christ died, the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. The Holy Spirit, by this signifying that the way into the holiest was now open. The conditions of entry were the same as those prefigured under the law. The crucifixion or rending of the flesh and the manifestation of God in our mortal lives. And our Lord, of course, did that perfectly, didn't he, brothers and sisters? But brothers and sisters, we are called to do it as well. We might do it imperfectly, but we have to show our faith in how we live. Do we not, brothers and sisters? We have to manifest the things of the spirit now in our lives. Even in these difficult times in lockdown, you know, we need to get that word into our minds, to to get that spirit thinking into our heads 
so that we too might enter through the veil that is our flesh, that that, that fleshly instinct will be destroyed when he comes to change our vile bodies and to make them like unto his glorious body, that it set like, like it says in Peter, that we will become partakers of the divine nature in that day, that we will manifest his character perfectly in the age to come. If we want that, brothers and sisters, and the glories of the kingdom, we have to sacrifice the flesh now, do we not, in these times of our mortal pro probation. And so that's my suggestion. I hope, uh, I hope it makes sense. What we're saying is, is that as the Lord went through his trials, he would no doubt have noted the white garment they had to wear, the red and the purple, and then he put on his own blue garment before going off to be crucified. And I believe all these things would have strengthened him and helped him as he would have seen that he himself was passing through the veil and soon he would be in the most holy and he would be with his father. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, it says in Hebrews 10, after telling us about the flesh being rent to, enter, to allow Christ to enter into the most holy. The exhortation is for let, to let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so we're blessed, are we not, brothers and sisters, to spend time around God's word, to spend time in our lockdown Bible school, attempting to live up to these exhortations. And in our lives, we think, do we not, um, about our failings and how grateful we are that we have an advocate with the Father and a representative through whom our sin can be forgiven and through whom we can have hope of salvation and the removing of our problem of this nature that we bear so that we might have eternal life with him in the coming kingdom.